Okay, so we've been talking uh, about how mindfulness is being used by corporations and some um, hyper-capitalist companies uh, to kind of, I don't know, calm their employees down and stop them from rebelling. Um, you wrote, you, you didn't write a book on this, but I think you read a book on this called uh, Mindfulness. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the book and the author? Yeah, so this is a book called McMindfulness by uh, a professor of management in America whose name is Ronald Purser. And he essentially writes a, a debunking book. So he saw this uh, concept of mindfulness and how it's been rolled out across the whole population of America mm -hmm. and studied it in quite a lot of depth uh, and came to some quite startling and interesting conclusions about, uh, firstly, the scientific evidence or lack thereof Mm. Um, of mindfulness and potential reasons why it's been incorporated so widely into American life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Should we, uh, I've got a clip of him, so why don't we just uh, yeah. watch that? And I noticed uh, around 2010, uh, a lot of companies, especially around Silicon Valley, uh, started jumping on the bandwagon, uh, bringing mindfulness programs uh, into into their uh, firms, into their companies. Um, and I've done a lot of management consulting in my day, and uh, I know how fads uh, come and go, and basically how some of these programs are used to uh, basically pacify workers, uh, to try to uh, uh, distill uh, dissent, uh, suppress uh, worker uh, dissent, and put all the, the burden back onto employees to uh, adjust and cope with uh, basically what amounts to very toxic uh, corporate culture. So th that was partly the reason. The other reason is I was sort of stunned by how rapidly this so-called mindfulness revolution took off because, you know, at one time, uh, as Buddhism made itself uh, uh, popular in the West, it was, it was a countercultural uh, anti-establishment uh, sort of uh, hippie-ish uh, uh, movement back when Zen was popular in the day. So when it morphed into uh, a 1.5 billion dollar uh, industry, that I really got my attention, and I, I started to take a step back and uh, you know kind of uh, uh, take a look at what was actually going on uh, with this so-called movement and. Uh, became more and more suspicious and more concerned in terms of how uh, what was uh, a spiritual practice uh, became co-opted and uh, basically uh, commodified and instrumentalized uh, to basically uh, serve corporate interest and uh, basically in other settings, for example, even the U.S. military, the U.S. Army, the U.S. Marines have been training uh, soldiers uh, in some shape or form of mindfulness. So that really uh, sparked my uh, interest and concern. So, I mean, what did you, what, what did he overall say in that book? Um, if you can condense a, a huge book into about three, maybe four sentences. And um, <laughs> did you agree with his thesis? So his, um, his book essentially talked about how mindfulness has become all the rage in uh, modern society. And it's been kind of endorsed by people like monks, people like neuroscientists, CEOs of big companies. And it's been used in the military. It's been used across schools and governments. And there's a lot of positive coverage about it. And Persa goes right to the heart of the, the issues surrounding it and debunks a lot of the myths um, about this so-called mindfulness revolution. Um, so he says that unlike what most people think, mindfulness is not the kind of cure all um, practice that's going to revolutionize or change the world. And part of it is the fact that the uh, stress that people, um, that people try and alleviate through mindfulness um, is deemed to be self-imposed by the mindfulness movement. Mm. Um, as we talked about, previously. And, um, and part of it is also looking quite deeply into the scientific evidence behind mindfulness and figuring out why it's, it's uh, disproportionately been um, hyped up.
yeah i think we'll come on to that in a minute um Dariopajan, anything you want to kind of say on that on on its social role of mindfulness? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I remember reading your article that you've written, um, Demir, and you know, you talk about Richard Branson being a big advocate of mindfulness. Um, this is a chap who, um, you know, he avoids paying tax and takes a lot of public. He, he he would like public money to bail out recently during the COVID crisis. His train engines, his Thomas the Tank engines. And, um, you know, on the one hand, doesn't pay any tax properly to the, the British economy, at least. Then he wants a bailout from the British economy when his industry goes down. And on the side, with his very understaffed trains, he's trying to basically push mindfulness as a solution for society to take on board. Um, and that's a great example of a kind of uh, you know, if he wanted to make the world a better place, a good place to start would be would be to pay his taxes at appropriate levels so that, you know, people could have enough currency and float to actually help them with the problems and the welfare issues that they're facing. Yeah. And, and to be clear, we don't, we're not saying he's kind of illegally dodging tax, but I think him and like, uh, like all kind of... No, he's not. It's, it's legal. It's, it's, you know, it's legal in, you know, but, um, but that's part of the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Because the same people who own these companies ultimately really own the, the governments and have undue influence over them. And as you say, if people wanted to kind of really contribute, then they would uh, pay the ethical amount of tax rather than the bare minimum, uh, you know, by having a bunch of shell companies and moving money around. Um, yeah. So I think I mean, the, 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 a good, you know, the Quran is um, pretty explicit in one of its last chapters upon the absolute necessity to pay uh, what it called legal arms. Hmm. Um, so that is that chapter is all about the the fundamental importance of paying your the legal arms the legal dues the legal charities what we would call tax hmm. um, in society and the absolute um, harm it can wreck upon a society if if a person chooses not to do so and when you have these large corporations that have legal loopholes to loopholes to avoid tax legally um, basically because they have uh, lobbied MPs lobbied parliamentarians to pass laws. Um, which uh, particularly benefit them, and this is seen massively in the United States, almost to a greater degree, I'd say, than in the UK. Um, I watched a really interesting clip recently about uh, Hillary Clinton's and Donald Trump's, uh, one of their uh, debates that they had. This is obviously four years ago, uh, in which Hillary Clinton points out that Trump uh, probably doesn't pay any tax. And very recently, there's been the re revelation of uh, Trump paying, I think, seven hundred and fifty pounds of tax in in one year, and um, you know Donald Trump turned around in that debate uh, on this particular clip I saw and said to Hillary Clinton, "Well, I do know differently to all of your donors. All of your donors don't pay any tax. Mm. I don't pay any tax. In fact, they pay less tax than even I do. So if you wanted to change it, you should have changed it in, le in legislation when you were actually a senator. Uh, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but he yeah. had a good point." <laughs> In his debate with Biden just uh, the other day, Biden attacked him on only having paid $750 of tax. And Trump said, well, you've been in government 47 years and this is the law and you've allowed me to do it. <laughs> Not a bad comeback. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's one big party and you're not invited, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, I, think, I think it's, you know, it's good to speak in a kind of you know, theoretical frameworks Mm. about our problems with issues but it's sometimes nice to kind of put your finger on a point and an issue and i think this is a good example when you have people who are ex ex exorbitantly wealthy so wealthy that if you worked and got a million pounds every day for the next thirty thousand years you would just about managed to get to accrue mm. the same amount and they're kind of pushing ideas of well you need to be able mm. to deal with the stresses i'm putting on you a bit better that's quite uh it stings yeah, it makes you think it's fulfilling a social role. And if, if the people in charge of a broken slash breaking society are pushing it, then is it part of the problem rather than part of the solution? And has it been hijacked in the same way, you know, religion as a whole has been hijacked in many instances uh, in, in very sinister ways. Uh, and, it, and it's no longer and it's divorced from its kind of original intention as mindfulness kind of been extracted and taken and then presented in a way and used in a way which isn't really reflective of its provenance. I think it's an extension of uh, how religion itself has been uh, commodified and 
privatized over the last couple of centuries. So, in, you know, initially a couple of centuries ago, religion was very much a collective um, kind of kind of thing. It was very much a fabric of society. Mm. And it now has been individualized. So it's kind of a taboo subject to talk about. It's not very, uh, the churches are not very well attended. It's all about one's individual spirituality. So it's, that's fine. You can have religion, but don't try and push it on anybody. Don't try and uh, spread it or talk about it or have any kind of community get together. I think it's perhaps not that extreme, but I think it's more of an individual thing in society rather than a, a societal um, thing. Well, well, I mean, France has gone to a far greater extent in that direction than the UK has. Mm. Um, but even in the UK, I think there's a there's an attitude of um, uh, that religion is an oddity and only weird people do it. And if you do it, <laughs> you know, if you do it, it's bad news for us. <laughs> if you do it, you better be an you be you like you're ethnic, like you're a bit ethnic, aren't you? <laughs> oh, he's a bit ethnic. He is. He's uh, he he's in, he's doing his prayers. He's doing his prayers. He's a good boy. But you know, it's like. Um, it does give that impression that if you're doing it, it's because you were brought up with it. And because, you know, if you're brown, then that's acceptable because you were brought up with it because you're from a, you're from a poor, and you're tolerated people poor, are tolerated. A poor nation yeah. where they still need to believe in God to uh, get by in life in terms of their stresses. And, and, you know, if you're English and you're religious, I think they're actually vilified much more yeah. actually in society because it's like, what's wrong with you? Like you're going to be one of us and you know, why do you need religion anymore? Um, and, and I think it's funny that they're introducing aspects of the kind of beginnings of introspection, which is the beginnings of a religious mindset at the end of the day, mm. back into their society, obviously because there's a massive need for it. Um, and actually, from a positive sense, you could say that this is actually the first, in a very, as a very tentative step, in a direction of society towards going back towards recognizing the benefits of religious belief and, and spiritual experience. I think when people try to demonize religion, they realize that actually society needs some kind of spirituality. And so what they did instead is uh, to have this vague notion of spirituality that no longer really means anything. It doesn't mean a relationship with God, which is what it used to mean. But now things like, um, going to music concerts can be seen as spiritual. Walking can be spiritual experience. Uh, I think the evangelicals you know? are going to have to take some of the blame for that. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but basically, spiritual doesn't mean anything. Anybody can be spiritual. Yeah, sunrise. Um, sunrise is spiritual, yeah. apparently. Yeah. A global yeah. Ball, ball of hydrogen rising over the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it means that it's a concept whereby uh, unrestrained kind of fulfillments of personal desires is seen as the objective of spirituality. And it's a shame because religion has a very different understanding of what spirituality means. And it's one that can benefit society as a whole rather than just fulfilling one's own desires. So what you're saying is that it's like um, that mindfulness kind of sees introspection as, as a route to obtaining your objectives and your desires more efficiently i think so it can be you can be a more effective and more productive capitalist or you know a better adjusted person to the consumerist society that we live in so yeah. it's actually doing the opposite thing to creating real spirituality it's actually making you more materialistic and more able to deal with the stresses of a materialistic world yeah i mean i don't know if it just i'm not sure i'm not sure personally if it makes you more like that. I think it kind of facilitates whatever is there in the first place and it can help you to become more effective at that because it doesn't give you any kind of moral guidance, right? It doesn't tell you how you should live. It doesn't tell you once you recognize your impulses, um, you know, you should curtail this one, but channel this one in this way. Uh, it kind of just makes you more aware of them. And I get maybe part of your point actually is, if maybe I'm understanding it now, is you're saying it makes you more aware of those impulses and helps you to fulfill them without actually giving you any guidance in kind of how to live. Because now I always like um, going to the Nazis to demonstrate points. I think it's an extremely effective way of talking about things. So like if you, if you kind of did a mindfulness course for Nazis, right, they would become presumably more effective at Nazism. And interesting you mentioned that because that actually happened. Really? really? So yeah, yeah. So Heinrich Himmler, he <laughs> was one of the- That wasn't a setup. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, yeah. So Himmler, who was a very, I think, I can't remember if he was the communications propaganda expert. Yeah. And what he used to do is venture with him and his Nazi fellow Nazis into kind of forests and conduct mindfulness retreats. So meditative mindfulness retreats before coming out and doing all the awful, horrendous things that they used to do. So mm. he was he was the main architect of the Holocaust. Mm. So there you go. So it shows really that that mindfulness can be used for good or for evil. And at no point does it even attempt to tell you which it should which it should be. So, what so you it should has, be more effective at, uh, at mm. basically. It's got no moral content and spiritual content in terms of how we define it as a relationship with God or relationship with something beyond. It's almost it, it doesn't do that. And actually it makes you stress upon looking within, which is kind of the opposite. Um and, and uh, maybe this is a good time to kind of discuss this origin in Buddhism before we go on to talking about whether it really works. Because, I mean, can you tell us a bit about its relationship with Buddhism and um, also the modern view of Buddhism, whether the modern view of Buddhism is, is correct in our, in our perspective? Yeah, um, so mindfulness um, essentially is derived from a Buddhist uh, path, which is called the path to enlightenment. And there's eight paths within this um, path to enlightenment. So um, I can't remember them all, but um, everything starts with right. So one is right mindfulness. One is right speech, meaning that one should speak it's in the right way. It's not good mnemonic, is it? It's <laughs> right, it's right, it's right. It's... Yeah, like right intention, I think, whereby you have to make sure that all your intentions are pure, um, right uh, concentration, right effort. So these kind of things um, that give quite a holistic picture into how one should live one's life yeah. with morality and the mindfulness is kind of an adjunct to it mm. so it kind of says well you do all these things but you do them in a mindful way and if you connect all of these uh paths together then you ultimately attain salvation um right conduct is another one and that involves no alcohol or drugs interestingly um and so did they mention that on the nhs and on the nhs course <laughs> <laughs> no they didn't um, and I think it's interesting because I spoke to some colleagues about it afterwards. I told them about this Buddhist link and they said it would be really interesting if we had some context as one, in one of our sessions. So perhaps in the first session they could tell us where mindfulness actually came from. But there was none of that there. And the problem with this course is that it just takes the right mindfulness aspect, but it ignores all of the other ones. Mm. Um, and that creates a problem because you're divorcing the original Buddhist teaching and in doing so, you're making it, I think, kind of meaningless in a way. I don't know if that's a bit harsh, mm. but it's it's not fulfilling its original purpose. And certainly the Buddhist purpose was a much higher one than what's now happening. 